and that way we'll just, uh, you know, everybody else can watch the recording later. Of course, as always, there's there. Okay. All right. So we we ended up talking, um, or we talked. Our only new mechanism, really, from the other day was. Um, looking at electrophilic addition reactions, specifically the acid catalyzed ones. Um, we didn't really answer that second question. So we looked at the mechanism here, which looked like this. Um, out of those two steps, which would we expect to be the rate determining step? Would that be like an electroflow attack from the five bonds to the protons? Or what would that be? Um, yeah, we would we would call that an electrophilic attack. Um, I guess it's not really an electrophilic attack because electrophiles don't typically attack anything because they're electron deficient. And so so it's more like the pi bond making a nucleophilic attack. Since we're always showing where the where the electrons are going, not where the where the positive charges are going. Yeah. So that's going to be our rate determining step because that's going to be the slowest step because we're making that that um, positive charge that carbocation that's going to be really unstable, right? And so very very quickly it will find something else to react with. Right. So it's just like our our second. Our first order reactions for SN1 and E1, the slow step was leaving group leaves in order to make your unstable intermediate. Um, and a lot of times that's almost always your slowest step in a multi step mechanism is going to be making the most unstable intermediate. It might not always be the first intermediate if we had like a, a five step reaction. But wherever you're going to make the most unstable intermediate, that's going to be the step that's going to be the slowest. Um, so what order reaction would we expect this to be then? Is first order, second order? First order. Well, it's not concerted, but remember that cons a concerted reaction doesn't doesn't have to mean that it's first order or second order necessarily. Concerted just means it all happens at once. So what determines the order of the reaction is going to be how many things have to run into each other in your slowest step. So because our slowest step involves both of the reactants, we can't we can't have the pi bond break without a hydrogen there as well. So you need you need this reaction to happen. You need both of these molecules, which makes it a second order reaction. Um, and that does actually get make some things a little bit weird. Um, in general, we think about catalysts as not being part of the rate law because they're not part of the balance reaction usually, right? But if your slowest step involves the catalyst molecule, you can actually wind up with a catalyst playing a role being in the rate law, even though it's not part of the balance reaction because it's concentrations affecting that slowest step. It, does it just goes against kind of like the basics of rates that we learned at Gen Chem, which were it was a lot more like oh you know catalysts don't affect anything they just start things or you know um, especially when we're talking about equilibrium 
and catalysts never affect equilibrium because remember for for if we're at equilibrium then that means we have the same reaction happening forward and backward at the same rate um and that the catalyst is never going to affect the relative energies of the of the products and the reactants the catalyst is just going to affect the relative energies in the middle of the process for this rate determining step. So it's, it's uh, HBR, is that the catalyst? So it's, it is a reactant in this case, but if we looked at, um, think about the acid catalyzed hydration we had And then we had it acid catalyzed. And a lot of times we'll just write it like this for acid catalyzed, where you just say put H plus above the arrow. Um, if it's acid catalyzed, then it's not going to be part of the balanced reaction because we're going to wind up adding a hydrogen from to one end of the pi bond and the OH from the water to the other side of the pi bond. Um, but the first step is something has to give has to break that pi bond we wind up regenerating the h plus so our first intermediate would just look like would look like that and then we'd wind up making this and we added here's our new hydrogen we just added and then we have the oxygen lone pairs here that can come in and touch. And so our slow step is actually involves the catalyst, not the balance reaction. So that's why I wanted to make that point, even though for H, the purposes of HBR and HCl, the acid is part of the reaction. But in this case, we, this is a great, great example of how it's not really part of the reactants. Um, necessarily that's going to be um, in the rate law there. That's a good question. I can't think of a case where we would use a weak acid as a catalyst. Typically weak acids introduce other side reactions that we don't want to happen. Yeah, most commonly, if we were using an acid, if we want to do an acid catalyzed and we didn't want competing reactions, like, I guess, let me go back to that same reaction we just had. If we're doing this reaction and we need it to be acid catalyzed, we wouldn't want to use HCl as our as our acid catalyst, right? Because that introduces a second reaction that can happen. You could get the the hydrochlorination reaction competing with the hydration reaction. So um, a lot of times we sulfuric acid is probably the most common. Um, acid that we use in OCHEM because the hydrogen sulfate that you get is the conjugate base, doesn't introduce a whole lot of side reactions, but a lot of times the halogens do, and a lot of times other weaker acids will introduce side reactions too. Acetate will react with this. So if we if we use acetic acid as our um, as our catalyst, then we would wind up making um, wind up making a side project, a uh, product, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, that's okay. Hopefully the uh, recording will go better this time and uh, everything should work out on the, on the recording. Um, and I think if I do it all like this, I think I wanna turn off the video. I think that'll work best.
All right. So then we ended talking about about how we can control the conditions a little bit. Um, and I left the couple the couple slides after this in. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we've talked about this um, fairly often last quarter. Um, but I just also wanted to. I just sort of hand waved the enthalpy part where I just said, okay, well, we're making all sigma bonds and sigma bonds are more stable than pi bonds. I didn't put any numbers to it. We can actually put numbers to that because um, a carbon carbon pi bond has a standard energy. It's not exact, but um, we can use it to estimate things. So we just look up, do you guys remember doing that in Gen Chem when we first started talking about enthalpy? You could say, okay, if I'm going to break these two bonds and these bonds, actually, we did it last quarter, didn't we? Um, so if we look up the standard energy for a carbon-carbon pi bond. We see that a carbon-carbon pi bond has an energy of 63 kcal per mole, and our hydrogen chlorine bond is 103 kcal per mole. Our carbon-hydrogen bond is almost the same. Our new carbon hydrogen sigma bond is almost the same there. So they more or less are gonna cancel each other out, right? We're gonna break that, so we put in 103 kcals. We're gonna get 101 back. And then we wind up making a carbon fluorine bond that's more stable than the carbon carbon pi bond was. So we wind up with a net change of negative 19 kcals per mole, which just to put it in joules, uh, for whatever reason, a lot, a lot of um, chemists, especially when we're when we're talking about enthalpies, still do their calculations in kcal's instead of in kilojoules. Um, but remember, a kilojoule is roughly four times bigger than a kcal, so this would be about minus eighty kilojoules per mole. So significantly downhill in energy. Um, and that's going to be pretty similar. Almost very few sigma bonds um, are going to be less stable than a pi bond. All right, so let's do a new mechanism then. So we have a whole bunch of different ways we can make, um, we can break up these pi bonds. Basically, all you need is an acid and a nucleophile. You have an acid and a nucleophile, you can do an addition reaction, um, which also means um, the order of the reactions is a little different in the chapter. Um, but just to complete that thought, um, no, I guess we wind up with, no, we're not gonna get into halo hydrogens yet. All right, so, what if we want to do a hydration reaction and we don't want it to go through a carbocation intermediate? Well, first off, why would it matter? Why do we need more than one mechanism to get to the same product? Would it ever be an advantage to not have it go through a carbocation intermediate? Is primary or secondary? Um, the other aspect to it is what's the other thing we have to take into consideration when we're doing our SN1 versus SN2. SN1 was slightly more complicated because what did you have to worry about? You lose the stereochemistry because it flattens out, but what else can happen? By... Rearrangement, that's the word I was looking for. Um, yeah, if we if we want a reaction to happen where a carbocation intermediate would go through a rearrangement and we don't want that, then we can't use acid catalyzed addition. We have to use something else. And so oxymercuration is, is the go-to mechanism um, that it's gonna give us basically the same product except with no rearrangement. Um, and it's because it doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate. All right, so the 
the way it's usually written um, is you're going to have this this dye this mercury with two acetates mercury two acetate is going to be their reactant and then we just expose it to water after that a lot of times um in these multi-step mechanisms will have separate reaction steps and sometimes we have more than one reactant in the same step so in order to not wind up spending um having to draw every single reactant out over here We'll write it like this. This doesn't mean it's catalyzed. This just means it's going to be a sequence of reactions. Remember how I said that organic chemists don't usually worry about balancing things. So we're just going to not worry about that. We care about our organic molecule that we started with, that we're going to end with, and this is just what we have to do to get there. All right, so the, the other thing that's kind of tricky about this is it has two distinct steps to it. Um, the, the one we're actually going to spend the most time on is the oxymercuration step because the demercuration is one partly because it's not all that well understood. There's, there's still a lot of even fairly fundamental mechanisms in organic chemistry they're not perfectly understood. Um, so they, they're they pretty sure that it goes through some sort of free radical pathway because they were able to, they've been able to do some studies on the demercuration part that show that it involves transfer of just a single electron at a time. Um, but that's not really enough for us at this level to be able to um, use that or for me to be able to test you on that. So, the, but the oxymercuration part is pretty well understood. And so it's, all the structures are here. I'm gonna go through and add the arrows as we go. Um, base, the first thing that really happens is one of these acetate groups on the mercury winds up leaving. Acetate's a pretty good leaving group. And if you think about it just in terms of your solubility rules, back from when we were talking about precipitation reactions, acetates were in that category of will always be soluble, right? So that's another way of estimating how tightly bound something is to a metal ion, especially is does it dissolve in water? Um, and if it does, that means it's not that tightly attached. So we first, first things first, you just wind up with leaving group leaves and you'd get a quick nucleophilic attack from the pi bond. So similar to what we had before, but what's a little bit different about it is that that mercury actually has a lone pair. You actually wind up with a um, an intermediate that looks that looks kind of like a carbocation. But because the mercury has a lone pair, it can sort of donate some of its electron density to that carbocation. And so it kind of exists as a weird resonance structure. Remember, one of our rules for resonance structures was you never break a sigma bond. This is kind of the exception to that. This exists as a resonance structure where one of the resonance structures looks like that, and the other one is like a you get a half bond between the mercury, and it's got a, a full covalent bond to the less substituted carbon and a partial bond to the more substituted carbon. So, and that's kind of what keeps it from going through the rearrangement, right? Same first step, but because it's mercury that's making the new bond and not a hydrogen that's making the new bond, it can kind of hold that, that positive charge in place. It's similar to like a hydrogen bond, like a chemical molecular bond? It's not like a supply or a sigma bond? It's, it's like half of a sigma bond. You get you get some over, orbital overlap, not enough to be able to say that it's definitively a sigma bond, um, but it's not quite like an intermolecular. It, it's it's similar to an intermolecular force. It's actually it's closest to um, 
remember talking about Lewis acids and Lewis bases? And that was when we said it's an electron donor, made it a base. Um, this is what's happening. Basically, if you have empty orbitals or lone pairs, they can sort of donate electron density into another orbital without making a full on bond. So, and there are similarities to intermolecular forces. Um, the textbooks that I was reading this morning when I was prepping for this um, made a very specific point of saying it's it's a resonant structure that does break the pi bond. Um, and they wouldn't go out of their way to make that statement and break a general rule um, unless there was good evidence for it. So I'm gonna go, go ahead and say it's not quite the same, but it's got some similarities to near molecular force. Um, it must be more than just the intermolecular force because otherwise it could still go through a rearrangement as long as your mercury could still be close enough to the other charge, right? As long as it could still get some stability there. So the fact that it doesn't is fairly suggestive. All right, so we have this, here's what I can do. I'm getting gonna be stuck using Zoom's notation tool. Might as well make the one advantage to Zoom's notation tool is that you can zoom in and then draw. PowerPoint doesn't let you do that. So there was our first step and here's that intermediate we get um, as our product here. And it's usually drawn as a three-sided ring, um, just so that it doesn't look like a carbocation, so you're not tempted to rearrange it. Um, but that the bond to the more substituted carbon is going to be notably weaker, which means our next step which is another nucleophilic attack. It's gonna look like that. You're gonna wind up breaking the, the carbon mercury bond on the more substituted carbon because that's the one that had the stronger partial positive. And, the, and again, that step looks just like our acid catalyzed addition as well, right? The only difference is instead of a carbocation, we get this weird three-sided mercury ring. So then once we go through that, second step, we get this molecule here, where now we have just a regular carbon mercury bond on the less substituted carbon. We added our OH here. I left off the proton transfer where we would drop off our extra H plus from our water molecule. Um, and then to, and this is really the second step is that demercuration part, because this is all of a sudden, this is pretty stable. It looks weird to us. We're not used to, we haven't done anything with organometallic chemistry yet. Um, but carbon can make fairly strong bonds with, um, with metals, provided they're close to the same electronegativity. So that's a pretty decent bond over there. And so that what we do to get rid of that, and this is the stuff that's not well understood, is basically um, we expose it to this compound called sodium borohydride, um, which is just is what's known as a reducing agent. So you remember talking about reducing agents versus oxidizing agents. Um, when I teach that section, I always make a point of like it's really confusing. It's what is being oxidized is the reducing agent because you're reducing whatever you put it with. This is why we use that terminology because we don't care about the sodium borohydride. It's going to get oxidized, but we don't care about what the products are. We care about the fact that when we take this and we add it here, it reduces.
reduces our organic component. So we call it a reducing agent because this gets reduced. More specifically, the hydro the uh, mercury gets reduced. Um, and so we actually wind up making metallic mercury as a byproduct here. And we get our alcohol out of it. So again, really not any, the first part, the part where we actually know the mechanism for it is really not any different than what we've seen before. It's just making a carbon mercury bond instead of a carbon hydrogen bond first. Um, and the second step, we're not gonna test you on the mechanism. So the basic bullet point here that we wanna pay attention to is it's still gonna be a hydration. It's still gonna follow Markovnikov's rule. The net result is still gonna put an OH group on the more substituted carbon, but it won't rearrange. It doesn't rearrange because of the mercury. Exactly. So. Exactly, because of this structure right here. That keeps that positive charge on, because it's really like a very strong partial positive because it does have that resonance structure. It's not a full carbocation that has the ability to rearrange. But it reduces the mercury, gives it the electrons to allow it to break away those other bonds. Yeah, basically it just, um, sodium borohydride is what's known as a, a lot of reducing agents in organic chemistry are what are called hydride sources. So basically if you have hydrogen bound to something that's less electronegative than it is, then you basically get a hydride, meaning a hydrogen with a negative charge as an ion. So we're used to pro thinking of hydrogen ions as being H pluses. Hydride ions are H minuses, which means They've got a pair of electrons. They're relatively stable, but they're really not very good at holding on to those electrons. And so they will come in and reduce something else by basically bringing their pair of electrons with them, which in the net result in this case is we kick the mercury off and add our hydride to the carbon here. It's just, it's a more complicated than just looking at, we're going to do more with sodium borohydride. Um, if not today, then next week. Um, because the next mechanism is going to be another hydration reaction um, that, again, doesn't allow for rearrangement and gives us the anti-Markovnikov product. So we're going to have three different tools for adding an OH group that allow us to put it exactly where we want it, more or less. As long as we have a pi bond, we can control, does it rearrange? Do I put it on the more substituted? Do I put it on the less substituted just by changing our reactants up? Is the partial positive on the mercury or on the other carbon? Um, there's a, I have a better figure. If I go to our textbook, uh, I believe, I think it was actually in the last textbook from last year, McMurray. I'm, I'm taxing this poor thick pet. Mm. Must have unread by it. Here you go. There it is. So there is, this is a unique enough of a situation that there is actually, it's a um, specific term for what we get. They call it a 
mercurinium ion. So that mercurinium ion is the one that you have a positive charge on the mercury when it's got three bonds to it. But if you break one of those bonds, you wind up with a positive charge on the carbocation, make a carbocation. But because this a carbocation means you don't have a full valence, this is less stable than putting a positive charge here. And that's that's kind of the driving force that allows it to make this somewhat unstable three-sided ring. What makes it stable enough to keep that carbocation in one spot is this, the fact we make this. And so when we have two resonance structures, if they're they're not going to be occurring, it's not a 50-50 mixture because the, the three-sided ring is probably slightly more stable based on the fact that everything has a full valence this way. But really, if, if this exists as an average of both of these, even if it's 75% here, 25% there, that's still a partial positive on that part. Right? So it's, think of it as being like 0.25 of a charge on that part, which is enough to make it attractive to a different part. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, not drawing the mechanism. Um, let's start by predicting the product for each of these. So just remember hydration reaction. So you break pi bonds, add an OH to one side, add hydrogen to the other side. Is our net result here. Um, and we don't need to worry about writing writing the acetates and the mercury, the metallic mercury as a product. Um, we're mainly talking about the organic products here. So for our addition reactions, we're not breaking any carbon-carbon bonds. We don't have any reactions that do that at this point, right? So you, you're always pretty safe to start by just drawing all the sigma bonds back. And then our new bonds that we added So more substituted carbon, break the pi bond, add your water molecule on both sides by splitting it up like that. So for B, it's gonna look, it's gonna be, and this is where I have to be careful as a, as a teacher. Um, because it's really, it seems really obvious to me having done this for enough time that it, 
it's really repetitive in terms of it's the same reaction, just the rest of the stuff attached to it is it looks a little different. Um, but it, I know it does take a little bit to get to the point where you can see those similarities sometimes. So same exact thing though, draw your initial carbons. You broke a pi bond, I'm gonna add the hydrogen goes to the less substituted side. The OH goes to the more substituted side. So questions on, on that, or does that look, makes a lot of sense as long as I'm the one up here doing yeah. it, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why I, I try to resist the urge to just like, this one's just the same. So I'm just going to skip it because repetition is what's going to really get it ingrained in there. Um, and this, frankly, this is why OCHEM has a reputation for being a memorization heavy class. Um, I don't like to teach it that way because I think that it makes more sense if we start from basic principles. A lot, the first quarter of OCHEM though, in a lot of schools is you just start memorizing reactions um, without any mechanisms. You, you don't even see a mechanism until the second quarter, um, which doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so this quarter is going to be the high volume one where there's a lot of reactions and they will all still make sense and they're is some memorization that comes along with that. But just know that if you do drill down on any one part of it, it will make sense according to the stuff that we've talked about in our four basic mechanism steps. Um, there's just, we're just gonna now take the almost scattershot approach and, and cover everything as fast as we can. All right, so what do we get if we do this with acid catalyzed hydration instead? We get a carbocation intermediate. What does the product look like for the first one? So carbocation rearrangements are the ones where you can, in fact, wind up with our carbon structure changing because we'd start with this intermediate. I don't think I like that as much as. So this is a little bit of a tricky one because it's a that quaternary carbon that's next to the positive charge has a methyl group that can wind up migrating over. So we wind up getting a yeah, yeah. So we wind up moving that methyl group over and now we get a tertiary carbocation, which then reacts with the water. So we, our final product, or the only clean up the messy one here. Our final product for acid catalyzed hydration would look like this. We added new hydrogen here and an OH here and the methyl group moved over. And so for, for a molecule like A in particular, and it's, we really have three very distinct ways we can add an OH in three different places. We haven't gone over the antimer carbon top version yet, but that's what's coming. So we can add it, the more substituted carbon that's part of the pi bond, the most substituted carbon that's the result of rearranging, or the least substituted carbon, just by changing our reactants and put with the same starting molecule.
what would our acid catalyzed reaction look like for the bottom reaction? It's gonna be a hydrogen migration or a methyl. Do we have a hydrogen? Our first intermediate looks like that, right? That's what we would get after we added. Yeah, so our carbon that can is adjacent to our positive charge doesn't have a hydrogen because it's already got four carbon bonds. So our final product here going to look like that. All right. How we feel about that? It's getting there. The nice thing is, is that the next wrinkle we're going to add doesn't change the mechanism at all. It's still the same make your mercurinium ion and then go through a demercurization and then do a nucleophilic attack um, followed by NABH4. The only difference is we can, the second step in our mechanism where our water really got involved was the water just acting as a nucleophile, right? Is there any reason we couldn't use a different nucleophile? Anything that works as a nucleophile is still going to attack that that um, partial positive on the more substituted carbon. So we can actually make a wide range of of products, not just alcohols, by changing what we put in right there. If it's not water, what would A look like if instead of water we said methanol. That's really sloppy. But take my word for it. That's a that's a three. Close. The methyl group's not going to act. With the, so the first step is still going to be make that mercurinium ion, right? You're absolutely right that one part of the molecule is going to act as um, one of our original steps. So here's our mercury. The second step once we were here, so this was a positive charge on the mercury. The second step once we were here though was water acts as a nucleophile to attack. Right there, right? Let me see if I can make this. So if it wasn't, if it wasn't CH3OH, if it was just water, this step would look like that, right? Lone pair attacks that more substituted carbon, the car more substituted carbon breaks the carbon mercury bond, right? And then we just had a proton transferred. Um, we would get a second intermediate. And our second intermediate would look like And then on the other side, then we had the mercury still attached over here, right? Technically, it's the mercury acetate. And that's got a positive charge on that oxygen. 
what do we what do we do to make things more stable when we wind up with an intermediate where you just have a water molecule attached to your organic compound? Yeah, we just have something act as a base. It could be, you know, anything, another water molecule. We have something that acts as a base, it can kind of grab that. The oxygen holds on to the electrons, we get an, al an alcohol, right? Okay, well, is there any reason it couldn't do the same exact thing as methanol? we would get an intermediate that looks like a methanol molecule attached instead of a water molecule attached. But a methanol molecule attached still has an acidic proton that's pretty easy to pull off from, with a base, right? So it's not that our, our methyl group is going to act as the hydrogen. It's that the proton from the, from the methanol is going to act as the hydrogen, just like we did before. We add a whole methanol molecule but we make an ether. We don't make a new carbon-carbon bond. We, we are still making a new carbon-oxygen bond. And so our final product then would just look like I'll color code it the way we did with the other ones. So we get an OCH3, a methoxy group attached on one side, on the more substituted side, and a hydrogen attached to the other side. So if you, and if you add up all the red atoms there, it's still methanol, just like a hydration reaction is still a water molecule just split into pieces. It's still a methanol molecule just split into pieces. So last thing, and then we'll take a, our break. If it's not methanol and it's not water, whatever is written in that second spot, that's going to be the nucleophile that's going to come in and, and attach to the more substituted carbon. It's just a matter of being able to look at that molecule and figure out what part of that molecule is the nucleophilic part. ETOH is ethanol, right? So if it's another alcohol, what part of the alcohol is going to be attracted to a partial positive? The electrons, right? It's still going to need a partial negative that can come in and act as a nucleophile. So the only difference is what gets attached. It's still going to be So adding a hydrogen to one side and the other side I have to slow down my writing. It doesn't like Zoom's annotations don't like when I write too fast. All right, so and I'm explicitly wrote this. Oh, just as a reminder that ET is just our shorthand for CH2CH3. If we did this same reaction with water here, we would just get an OH here, right? Same reaction, same mechanism, same steps, and different final product. And I'll let you give be a try on your own, and then we'll go through it when we come back from break to solidify that in there a little bit. So let's let's say by we'll go by that clock, which is pretty on. We'll go come back at seven after.
we'll get some more practice with this. Just looking for a coffee mug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's what's breakfast today? I pulled it out this morning to see if they were putting it down at 10 but for class. Yeah, they probably just hadn't gotten set up yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. Doing this, this um, yeah, I think most quarters that they try to do free breakfast in the commons um, for the first week of classes. Um, and so there's the, usually still some food left at or at noon or so, so you can make a lunch out of it.
Do I feel well? No, I like I can't tell if I'm trying to break it. Uh, no. Yeah, I just know I'm starting. Me too. Me too, yeah. Nope, I like, I'm like, I feel like I'm getting sick, and then I like, I wake up, and then I get up and go, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. So I can't decide. Probably take out the driveway and like come feel better because it didn't last winter. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to lose eight feet. Yeah. Like considering, like, trying to figure out what we're going to run today. So what we're on today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have, like special, like, icy shoes? Um, yeah, I just don't know what that Today would be a good day for it because it's like coming up a little bit, but you know. So it's cross country still done or is it done? Um, um, cross country is done, but track season. Is there already train for driving? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but your first meet is like 70 to the February. Okay, wow. So you guys have to train stores for that? Yeah. Really? That's weird. Yeah. Because yeah, the, the track is going to be very. Yeah. I think we're going to have to like dig it out or someone wants to fill. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Just a lot of, a lot of running and stuff. Mm -hmm. But we're also like going um, like more into like the weightlifting yeah. pro side of it too, so like that much more fun. That's cool, yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, I got a single sugar one. It's like a weird sweet, but it had some really good, like, everything. Like, all kinds of cool like, sweet stuff on them. So, yeah, there's not a lot of people here in the park. Really, so, so Bagels today, Sean. Bagels. From, um, from Tahoe Bagel? I think Dragonfly. Oh, Dragonfly. Okay. I actually, for whatever reason, I've never had Dragonfly. I get South... The, the Tahoe bagels all the time, but Dragonfly is always sold out. Which one's Tahoe bagel? Yeah. They're the ones right next to um, where the Rite Aid was. Oh, it's like three or something. Yeah. Or yeah. They do a really good breakfast sandwich that's really cheap. It's $9 for a bacon, egg, and cheese bagel. And it's, and or whatever meat. They, they have a really good Italian sausage patty that they make if, you do, if you're into that sort of thing. But, and you can't get like a, a satisfying breakfast for $9 in town anymore. He's pretty good. He's my favorite. Yeah. Do you know where Sedellis is? They, they actually share space with Sedellis sometimes. Um, so, right behind the DMV. Oh, right. Um, and yeah, you know, they're I've heard mixed things about the owner as a person, but their their bagels I've heard are really good. That's around some super and she had a really awful experience. So Yeah. Uh I don't have any personal experience with that person. And they do get along well with Chris Seidel over at Sidellis, and I like Chris a lot. Um, so I won't say too much, but I have heard rumblings. Yeah. All right. If we're getting back to it over here, is there anything substantially different if it's a nitrogen acting as our nucleophile? Still got a lone pair. Still got a lone pair, right? So our product would look like. To make sure I get the right. It would look like that. We just wind up with an ethyl group attached to a nitrogen instead of an OH group. So there is another hydrogen still attached there. Because it was NH2, because nitrogen only has five bonds, or um, has five valence electrons, so, so it makes three bonds. Does one hydrogen go to the other side of the with five bonds? 
it's not the same hydrogen. The net result looks like that. So we have to be careful with the acid catalyzed hydrate, even with the acid catalyzed hydration, right? It was not the same if we color code this. Um, and then we had, we'll do the water in blue and we'll do the acid, the acid catalyst in red. So the first step is grabbing the H plus there. So then the intermediate looks like this, and we have hydrogen there, which means our next step is our water attacks. and then the proton transfer. So we actually wind up following our color coding scheme. And then when we do that second proton transfer to take the water molecule that's attached and turn it into an OH, we regenerate our catalyst Right, so our final product, we started with propene plus water with an acid catalyst. We wind up with propanol, and we get the reason it's a catalyst and not a reactant is because we regenerated that same H plus we started with, but it's not the same atom. So that's all that to say is you just have to be careful with the way you you present that, the way you said that, you said, well, it just takes one of the hydrogens from the nitrogen and move to the other side of the pi bonds. That's what the net result looks like, but it's not the same hydrogens. So you don't want, if you oversimplify that too much in your head, you can wind up confusing yourself on that. Um, and they've actually shown this to be the case. We can actually prove this because if you, if you um, do this reaction with, the acid catalyst, where if the acid catalyst is deuterium instead of just regular one proton, if it's a proton with a neutron, we wind up making a molecule that has a mass number that's off by one. So it shows that the deuterium is the one that gets included um, in the final product, not the one that starts as the water molecule. Yeah. It's, and that's, they call that, um, doing isotopic studies or isotopic experiments where you, okay, if, if you want to figure out exactly where each atom goes, not what the net result is, but the specific atoms, they do this a lot with um, biochemistry is you can do something like put glucose where all of the hydrogens are deuterium into a cell. And then you watch what molecules have deuterium incorporated into them after the cells had a chance to try and digest the glucose. And you, so that's how they were able to figure out things like the citric acid cycle, which was, oh, okay, well, all of a sudden I'm getting fumarate that has a bunch of deuterium on it instead of just regular fumarate. That must mean that the fumarate was part of that process of breaking down the glucose. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. They had to get they have to get pretty clever with it because you can't observe the stuff directly, right? So it's awesome. And mass spec is a big part of that, right? Because it would make, it's, if you have something where it looks just like the mass spec for regular fumarate, except everything is shifted up by one mass number, you can be pretty sure that that means that it's got a deuterium attached to it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's do, this is the first time that we've seen um, a synthesis question. So the synthesis questions in OCHEM are basically just asking you to work backwards. 
instead of here's a react here's your reactants what does it make it's this is what you want how do you make it? what do you start from to get to here to start end goal instead of starting from a known spot so the logic is a little bit backwards you just have to be able to work the reactions backwards instead of forwards how do you make this ethoxy cyclopentane, pick any alkene you want, and how could we synthesize that? And these ones, because all it really takes is an alkene and an alcohol to make an ether, right? But it doesn't really matter which one is the alkene and which one's the alcohol. So usually there's two possible answers for these, right? So if we started... We could start with the oxygen attached to the ethyl group and the alkene being the cyclopentyl group. And really, we would want to put plus, we, we need the, the mercury acetate. Um, we haven't really used this abbreviation. We used, we've used ME for methyl and ET for ethyl. AC, um, in organic chemistry, that's not actinium. That's an acetate for, just to save ourselves some space. Never mind, you know, an acetate group is CH3CO2 with a negative charge. So rather than rewrite that every time, especially since it's not something that's a really a significant part of this molecule, um, we would just write the right AC. And a lot of times, They'll say it'll say OAC because that's indicating it's the oxygen from the acetate that's attached to the mercury. Doesn't mean there's an extra oxygen. Exactly. Um, and these ones, and also just a small note about back here in a second and answer these questions but it's a small note about the way that these are written so typically if it's set, if you've got a num if you've got numbers that means you have to do them in discrete steps you have to stop a lot of times there might even be a purification step in between steps one and two sometimes um, if you can do they call it a one pot synthesis um, which is basically like a one pot meal where you just throw everything in and things naturally happen in the right order. Um, or you just have to add it in, you know, add your first ingredients and then after an hour you add your second ingredients. Sometimes you can do it that way, but sometimes you have to be able to, or you have to separate them out and purify it before you go on to the next step. Um, but this in general, if they're written in the same step with a comma, that means that they're kind of all going to get added at the same time. Sometimes, like there's, you know, when we read procedures, it'll say add your mercuric acid, acetate first and then add water or add it all together. It'll specify in procedure, but it's usually at the same time. Um, and then if you have the two, that means you, you're going to make 
not only is there time separation as far as actually adding it in, but it usually means that you're going to make a stable product in between those. You won't make something really unstable like a carbocation and then have it last long enough for you to add a second molecule later. And so you're going to wind up with, with um, it's not a multi-step mechanism, it's a multi-step reactions, multiple reactions really is what it is. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's um, There is a chemistry blog called just, it's just like cooking or something like that. That's that's fairly popular among chemists because it really is just following a recipe, right? Um, and once you know what some of the basic steps are, you can start to improvise, right? You still plan it out, it's still a lot more like baking than it is like cooking, but you can start to make your own adjustments once you understand the processes. All right, so what about, so the way we would we would write out our answer here, um, we we would say okay if I'm trying to make that product, then I'm going to start with cyclopentene HgOAc two comma ethanol. And then you can't forget the second step, which is removing the mercury. Oops, in a. BH4. Um, the nice thing about those hydride sources and those reducing agents in organic chemistry is they pretty much all look, there's a few of them. They have that are like different strengths for different applications, but they all look like um, a stable plus one metal ion, and then a metal ion, a metalloid, usually something that's closer to the metal non-metal line, and then a bunch of hydrides attached. If you have a bunch of hydrides and two metals, it's almost always a hydride source. The other really common one is lithium aluminum hydride, which is so it's. L I A L H four. That one is like the nuclear option when it comes to reducing things. That will reduce everything, um, including air. Um, you can actually reduce oxygen or CO two in the air and turn it into um, formic acid, and then if there's enough, it'll keep going from there. Um, that comes back a little bit later when we start talking more about redox reactions in OCHEM. The other answer we could have for this first one is this is this is the better the better option because cyclopentene is relatively stable and and it's a liquid at room temperature and ethanol is really common and really cheap and easy to get. But we could switch where the double bond is and where the OH group is. If we just swapped, if we started from cyclopentanol, if we started with the oxygen there and we started with our pi bond here, we could do ethylene is the common name for ethene. And then have that react with cyclopentanol, again, with the mercuric acetate. Same net result, though, right? Um, in cases where the Markovnikov rule comes into play, both of these, both carbons are identical in terms of the where the pi bond starts, right? So Markovnikov's rule and rearrangement doesn't really apply, doesn't really make much of a difference here. Um, but in certain cases where we, where um, there might be more sterics, or if one of the one of them is more substituted versus less substituted, it can be an advantage to, to 
switch which one is the alcohol and which one is the alkene to start with. But the net result is the same either way, um, in, especially in this case. It's more just from a practical point of view. This is still a liquid at room temperature, so nice to work with, but that's a gas at room temperature. You don't really want to have a gas as a reactant in OCHEM because then you have to bubble it through your reaction mixture or you have to keep it pressurized and contained. So as much as we can, we would rather work with things that are already both liquids or solids. So theoretically, it'd be the same product, but practically it'd be, it'd be a lot harder. Steps, yeah. yeah. Trying to think of a good cooking analogy. There's, there's, you know, there's lots of shortcuts in cooking, right? And if you could do it the long way, um, but why would you do that, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's look at B. So this one, we're not ending with an ether. So we're not ending with an ether. Then we're not going to be reacting an alcohol with an alkene. What are we going to react? Basically, the two pieces that we're putting together, one of them is an OH, right? So what is your, your OH group if you put the hydrogen back on it? It's a water. So this is going to be a straightforward hydration reaction. And then everything else that's not a water or a hydrogen is going to start as the same piece. Did it again. It's not technically the right way to write it. It's supposed to be the boron first, but because I started writing the hydrogen first. Except, what am I missing? These are addition reactions, right? High bonds. So, and the reason I didn't put it in there yet is because we have two choices for where we can put it. Right? We want we want one end of the pi bond to be at the tertiary carbon, but the other end of the pi bond it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, and I think based on because mercury is a pretty big atom. I think that sterics will come into play to some extent. So I think we'd get a better yield if we put it there. But in theory, you could put it on to either of the secondary carbons there as well. It should get decent results. And this also brings up, you know, why would we use mercury when we could just, this one, it doesn't matter if it goes through a, a rearrangement, right? We're putting an OH on, this, on a tertiary carbon either way. So does it, we could just use acid catalyzed here. And that has its advantages because one, mercury is expensive in general. Anything with mercury in it is going to be relatively expensive, especially when we start using some um, organo mercuries. Plus, it's toxic, right? Organic um, organo mercury compounds are really nasty. And that means it's also expensive to dispose of it even if we don't damage ourselves um, in the process of using it, we still we have to pay extra to get rid of it at the end. So why would we use it? Well, because the yields are better. We get about a 92% yield with oxymercuration. If you do the acid catalyzed addition, we get something around like 50 to 60%. Um, so is the carbocation zero to 
It's because, and because it's an equilibrium reaction, because you're going to wind up being some equilibrium with where your your alcohol could go through an elimination to give you back what you started, right? Um, so not it gives us more control and also the better yields because this first reaction happens pretty much to completion and the second reaction happens pretty much to completion. That's a, and neither of them is really a true equilibrium reaction. You can't get them to happen backwards under normal conditions. Um, there is some green chemistry research on what can we use for, to replace. There's a lot of heavy metals that get used as catalysts and reactants in organic chemistry. Um, and there's some work that's being done to try and replace it. But in general, we just don't get great yields. And so it's a matter of balancing. Um, is, it, is it worse for the environment and for people? to use small amounts and get good yields, or to use something that's slightly less toxic, but maybe it's still toxic, like copper maybe. Um, you could use copper and get 70% yields, but then you have to use more copper because your yields aren't as good. And exactly, there's other waste, and copper is itself toxic. So there's, from an environmentalist point of view, organic chemistry is not, not perfect. It's a balancing act constantly between how do I keep things safe and healthy for the planet as well as I need to make this product or yeah. our company's going under or you know, I'm so going to fail this class or do you use like toxic chemicals to make something that's like a medicine? Exactly. Exactly. Just in general, you should always be aware of any, anybody who says they have a, a simple solution to a complex problem. Um, they probably don't understand what they're talking about. All right, so um, that's the general gist of these synthesis problems. When, with We only have three reactions, really, that we know so far, right? We have addition reactions, elimination reactions, and, and substitutions. So we have kind of limited tools when it comes to these synthesis reactions. Um, but as we start adding more details, we're going to start having more and more ways we can get to, to certain products. We're going to wind up with it, um, having a lot of multi-step synthesis where to get all the way from point A to point F, you have to go through B, C, D, and E in the middle. Um, and so those are the really tricky ones. Just This is just to kind of warm up our brains and get used to the idea of sometimes we work backwards through a reaction. Um, and in fact, the other thing I wanted to point out is once again, chemists are very, very picky about their arrows. Um, if you see it, an arrow written like this, that's called a retrosynthetic arrow, meaning basically it's going to, um, we're writing it right or left to right, but it's going backwards. It's it's saying, okay, undo the reaction. And what did you start from? Um, and so those are useful in sort of like making your roadmap, just like we did for our, our conversion word problems in Gen Chem. We had to have like a plan, right? Um, a lot of times in organic chemistry with these synthesis problems, you have to have a plan. And so these can be helpful to say, okay, um, I don't know why, I, in terms of pr printing a book, they, they use this a lot. And practically speaking, on a piece of black pa paper, just start at the bottom right and go up and left when filling it in rather than using these. But I just want you to be aware of what those arrows mean. Um, it just means that. It means that the actual reaction will happen backwards relative. It'll happen from right to left. So, right. Yeah, exactly. And again, I'm sure I would have, I was never, I never did much in research or in grad school with synthesis. And I'm sure if I spent more time in the OCHEM synthesis world, maybe I would have more of an appreciation for how those are used. Um, but that's not the case at this point.
I had one of my, so my undergrad, we had, we had four chem majors the year that I graduated. And so we knew each other really well because we'd taken every class together for four years. Um, and two of us, three of us went to grad school, two in chemistry, one, one sold his soul and went to UCLA law. And now he's a, he's a lawyer for biotech firms, um, and makes a boatload of money. Um, and the other one who went to chemistry grad school went into organic synthesis and also in San Diego, we lived in, in, uh, San Diego. So lots of, he went to UCSD, um, and he, he could probably tell me more. I haven't talked to him in a long time. The other one was last I heard was still a bouncer at a bar in Gasland. Um, living his best life, got a chemistry degree, and now I'm just going to be a, be a bouncer and play in bands. Is that normal for chemistry majors or like the cohorts to be small? Smaller than, than biochemistry and smaller than biology. Um, usually chemistry, and actually usually smaller than physics even, because it kind of is a, it's a niche in between them. Um, a lot of people that are good at math will major in physics just because they're good at math, um, but they don't really like chemistry because chemistry makes too many approximations and the, and the biologists um, and biochem majors tend to stay away from the, the hard math of upper division chemistry. So they tend to go more the bio route so that straight chemists tend to be a lot, at least in the, in the last 20 years or so, um, there's fewer chemists than biochemists or physicists. And actually, there are some physicists that manage to bypass chemistry entirely. Um, Kathy's degree, her PhD is in, in biophysics. So usually you have to go through chemistry to get from, from physics to biology, but biophysics kind of bypasses that and just looks at um, biological molecules and their physics properties, not their chemical properties. So, so we could do a new mechanism. Found this meme the other day. We have, we have 20 minutes. No, we have less than 20 minutes. Um, so we won't start a new one right now. Let's let's work on some more synthesis. This bottom question here: How could the following be synthesized from three methyl one butene? So in both of these cases, we're starting from the same molecule. but we want to get to two different products. Mm -hmm. wrong button. There it is. So from 3-methyl-1-butene, how do we get A?
So A is actually a little, it's the trickier one in some ways. It's the first reaction we learned, first hydration reaction we learned, but it has to go through a, mech, a rearrangement to get there, right? So, but this is a case where even though oxymercuration gives us a better yield, we, we would want to use the acid catalyzed hydration because we want the rearrangement. And if we want to keep it from rearranging, we have to go the oxymercuration route. It's a little sloppy, but can everybody read what I was writing? All right, so with our six minutes left, So for A, so this is A and B. B okay. is the one I drew in blue. Right? And then A is the one that I did in black. Okay. Yeah. So if you do the acid catalyzed hydration, okay. you get the rearrangement, which gives us the product we want for A. And so we got confused if I use uh, mercury on the first. No, sorry. That's why I said the, the second one is actually simpler because there's no rearrangement. It's a trickier reaction, it's more writing, but there's no rearrangement to it. Hopefully the first one when you write the first step, because um, it could be any acid, what would you just, could you just write acid? Or... You could either write H plus, you could write H2SO4. Like I said, um, what, if we're trying to minimize um, our nucleophile, then the acid that we usually write, sometimes, so sometimes you'll just see it written as H plus, sometimes it'll, you'll see it written as acid. Sometimes it'll just be, it'll be specific H2SO4, especially if you're reading like a procedure, they don't want you to just go pick a random acid, right? Um, the other one that you'll see written is sometimes you'll just see it written as hydronium, um, H3O plus, which is effectively the same thing as saying this, right? The water plus H plus is really hydronium. Um, again, one of those places where it would, as, Picky as chemists are when it comes to standardizing language and arrows and everything like that, they're not when it comes to the way we write that lists for whatever reason. There, there's, you know, I won't call them competing standards, but multiple ways of saying the same thing. Yeah, it's Good. All right, then do. One more synthesis question. How do we get from let's see.
And the other thing that you will see is occasionally when it's a synthesis question, just like sometimes um, if you're writing a logical test in a math class, you'll write an equal sign with a question mark over the top of it. Does it equal that or not? Sometimes you'll see a reaction arrow with a question mark over the top. It just means how do you get this? That's just saying this is a synthesis problem. How do you get from here? We would need a pylon. So how can we? Or it's going to take more than one step. Do we have any reactions where we could take a chloride and turn it into something with a pylon? <clears throat> right now, there's you only, you only have a few tools, right? So. If you think of when it comes to synthesis, every reaction and every mechanism we learn is a new tool in the toolbox. So we only have three mechanisms really. We've got substitutions, eliminations, and additions, three classes of reactions. So if we want to do an addition, because that's going to be how we can put the OH where we want it, we first need to get to something with a pi bond. So here's our roadmap. Once we get a pi bond, we can do a hydration, right? And either hydration would work at this point because both cases were make, putting the OH on a tertiary, right? So how could we get from the chloride what are the, uh, how could we cause an elimination to happen? And one that's going to make the Zaitsev product. Yeah, so it could either be an E1 or an E2. Um, E2s usually have better yields because you can use stronger, stronger bases. We just need a strong base, right? We want a strong base that's not a, a great nucleophile, ideally. So we might go back to our list from our, from our final exam um, that had, okay, here are our strong bases that are weak nucleophiles. Most of the time, though, we're going to see that it's a, if it's a strong base, it's also a strong uh, nucleophile. So if we add heat, that was going to, that favors the elimination, right? So you could do it probably hydroxide would probably make sense. Um, you could get more specific if you didn't want any substitution side product happening. Um, you could, there are bases that are strong bases that are, and weak nucleophiles that will still give you the Zaitsev product. But NaOH is a good, good standard base to use. And adding heat gets it to favor elimination over substitution. And then once we make our cyclohexene, we can go through oxymercuration.
It would if you could get it to to go SN one, because then it could rearrange. Because um, if you've got it to go SN one, get that chlorine to be able to leave, and then have a carbocation that could rearrange. Um, but those first order substitution reactions just typically also aren't great yields, and they're, they're kind of picky about how you could get it. The SN two. As long as it was primary or secondary, you could control SN2 versus E2 pretty well. But SN1 and E1 were a lot trickier because you were making that super unstable intermediate. Um, and so this would be a case if we were trying to do this commercially, or even, even not commercially, if we were just trying to publish a new synthesis for doing this, um, you want to. You want to maximize your yield as best you can, right? So is it better to get to have you know a 70% yield and then a 90% yield, or is it better to have one step that's only a 50%? Depends on the specifics. We would actually probably run both of them and see which one we could get better yields with by tweaking the conditions. Publish that. Um, but just like when we we're talking about about uh, oil refineries and how like an extra half a percent of efficiency in oil refineries can be like billions of dollars for the company, um, biotech works the same way. Getting an extra one percent yield on a billion dollar product, like you know, I don't know, Ozempic or cholesterol medication or something, um, an extra one percent yield can be a huge deal economic because Reactants are expensive. Reactions in general are expensive because you have to maintain all the right condition. So there's a focus. That's really what chemical engineering is, is taking the chemistry principles and now how do I streamline them, optimize them, monetize them. Um, and so it's, it is a big field as well. Um, and big concepts to be that are worth worth thinking about. So anyway, we're over a little bit. Sorry. Um, we did start a couple minutes late too. So with the snow and whatnot.